Hey, as we gather this morning, and uh, I was asked to cover Pastor Keith for these next two weeks, uh, it's been a time of reflection for me, uh, finishing 29 years at First Lutheran Church on staff, where I started as director of uh, youth and young adults and moved into family life and moved back to just worship and counseling. And so it, it is a picture for me of grace. And it's where I've learned so much about grace in this place that I'd like to take you on a little bit of a journey this morning with me. Uh, over 30 years ago, I was traveling with the crew, my band that had been together at that time for a few years. We'd done youth gatherings, and we were traveling across the country at that time full-time representing Concordia College in Edmonton. And it was actually Fred Jarvis at the School of Evangelism with Pastor Ed Mons that said, we want to meet with you. We want to have a little chat. They were looking for a new parish worker here at First Lutheran, and uh, I was a year into my stint on the road, and the timing just was not right. And I said, thank you very much. I'll look at the job description and said, thank you. No, it's not for me at this point. A year later at the School of Evangelism, Fred Jarvis and Pastor Ed Mullen said, we'd like to meet with you. Well, a year more on the road had taught me that maybe life on the road wasn't all it was meant to be, especially for a married guy. And so I met with him and looked at the job description and said, you know what, okay, let's look at this seriously. Let's pray about this. Let's come to Kelowna, have a little interview. I came, I met with different groups. I met with the parish planning council. I met with uh, different groups within the congregation. And I said, there's no way. The congregation was on verge of a major blow up. Every meeting that I met with was about the tension in the congregation. Every meeting was about whether the pastor should stay or go. There was a major conflict going on. I phoned Bill Nye, who was working in the district office at that time, and I said, uh, Pastor Bill, I don't know why you suggested me for this position, but nobody should be taking this position. He said, well, why? I said, there's, there's major conflict going on here and probably needs a little bit of help. Well, it was a little bit prophetic because just weeks later, things blew in this congregation. It was not a place where grace was abounding, I can tell you. And they worked through a process with... Pastor Nye to work out some of the healing that needed to happen in the congregation between groups and the pastor and individuals. And it was, a, it was a tough time for the church family. And then Pastor Nye called me back and he said, it's all good. You can go. If you want this job, you should go. He lied. <laughs> it wasn't so good. But I was here. And I actually believed, and I've said this to Janet more than once, we believed that our time here would be two years max to help people see that God's grace is really what this congregation was about, to heal and to move on, to say some tough things and move on. I learned to enjoy rye a lot during those first two years, I can tell you. There was four-hour meetings twice a month, and at least half of that time was spent deciding whether the pastor should stay as the pastor or should leave. Some of you were there in those meetings. Those were tough days. We needed to be reminded of God's grace, that we're all broken. As individuals and as a church, we're broken and needed health and healing from God if we were going to move on. And we moved on, slowly, plodded through, continuing to point to the cross, the reason we exist, that God loves people and wants better for them and has a plan and has all in his gracious big picture to include everyone, that he wants us all to get home safely. That was my job in the early days, help the church remember what we were about. Point to Jesus who wants healing in relationships for us personally, with each other, and most importantly, with him. Um, my 29 years here really have been a picture of grace. The congregation extending me grace, individuals extending me grace, uh, me learning a lot about grace. I had Michelle pull some pics from my earlier days at First Lutheran that we're going to put up on the screen. That's when I had hair. That was probably year two. I was 27 years old. That uh, was in the early years of First Lutheran Christian School, leading chapel. Look at me, style king, right there. 
That was the old sanctuary. That was uh, me and uh, VBS. In those days, our VBS started to boom. It's actually one of the reasons we pushed out into the community, and the community came to us. The amazing team of volunteers we had at that Bernard location, and we built a VBS that actually helped bust out the walls of that place. That was me as a train conductor leading. Oh, same, same guitar, by the way. Uh, next one. Family Fun Day, we did parking lot parties where the community would come. Some of you remember that. I think probably, Fred, you were probably one of the people that sat in that dunk tank. Some of you came to be members of this church because of events like that at our old Bernard location. I can see you here today. I know who you are. Family camp. That little girl on my lap is the one playing piano this morning. Oh, she's back over there. That was me taped to the wall as youth director. I put this up here because it was one of the times I needed grace. When we pulled the duct tape off the wall, there was a lot of paint missing. <laughs> but for me, it was a time where I learned about grace. This next picture, Henry Imthorn. We didn't get a close-up of him. Henry is supervising the building of the church floor, the hardwood floor in this building. And Henry also helped not only build, but raise this cross right here into the sanctuary. He was one of the builders of the Bernard location. He's Carmen Kentel's dad. But he was the director of the, uh, of the board of family, the youth and families when I came here. He was kind of like my boss. And one of the things I will never forget that he said to me as I started, do your best and I'll cover the rest. You blow it, I'll have your back. Shortly thereafter, Bill Nye from the district office came to lead a church staff retreat, and he said the same thing. When he works with people in the church, he likes to tell them if he's their boss, do your best. God has a plan for it, and I'm going to cover the rest. I got your back. It's what God says to you and I every single day. You know what? I've created you. I've made you my own. I've redeemed you. Do your best, because I'm going to empower you. And when you blow it, I got your back. And our friends, grace, unmerited favor. There was another thing that Henry said to me in those early days. He said, Gary, church workers and pastors stay way too long in the Okanagan Valley. They come and they stay past their prime, and they reach the peak, and then they stay too long. He said but I'll promise you, I'll tell you when your time is done. <laughs> so we had a little ongoing story. I said, Henry, is my time done yet? No, you're not quite done here yet. Well, Henry went to be with Jesus in a personal way a few years ago, and I can't have the conversation with Henry anymore. And I'm not going to pretend that Henry's been speaking to me from heaven, but there are so many things prayerfully that have lined up for me to not be on staff here anymore. The timing is right in our congregational history to get fresh blood as we head into this new season. Fresh ideas, fresh energy. I'll still be here. As Jess announced a few weeks ago, I'm now full-time volunteer. I'd like to think part-time volunteer, but I'm still volunteer. This is my grace place. This is where I've learned that I can be forgiven when I blow it as a church worker, as a human being, as a father, as a husband, as a friend that there's grace even for me. There was a time, more than one time, when people have said to me, oh, you're, you're the church that, you're the church that, there's a lot of divorced people there. Yep, we are. There's a lot of everything here. Because that's what God, grace, welcomes. Broken people who miss the mark. And I'm proud to be a part of a church that does that. Um, Pastor Keith, on vacation, as I said, his two-week series that started at the beginning of uh, July, where he focused on grace, I'm just going to review quickly to catch up if you were not here, um, because grace is used in so many different words in different ways in our society and misunderstood, especially if you didn't grow up in a church family, but even for those of us who did. Uh, in week one, he looked at Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace we are saved through faith. It's not from yourselves, it's a gift of God not from work so that no one can boast. Yet we are so bound and determined to judge people based on their works, how good a job you did. This kind of flips it. For by grace you and I are saved through faith. That's why Jesus came, because we could never be good enough to earn forgiveness and salvation. 
That was week one. Grace defined as unmerited favor, a gift that we don't deserve and not getting what we do deserve. I think back to a time very, and it, it might, this might actually ring for some of you, where I was speeding, I had people with open liquor in my vehicle. Yes, true. And we got pulled over by the police. It was in a rural Alberta town, and I thought, oh, no. He came up and got my license and registration. He could see what was going on, and he walked back to his car. He came back, and I thought, okay, we're getting this car impounded. I'm in Alberta, and how, how do you explain that to a congregation? How do you explain that to so many people? I came back, and he said, uh, first of all, you're going a little fast. Second of all, you got open alcohol in the car. You should probably take the car and park it wherever you're going as quickly as possible. There's your warning. And I thought, wow. I didn't get what I deserved. In fact, I got what I didn't deserve. Unmerited favor, a gift. How many of you have received an unmerited gift of favor, of forgiveness when you didn't deserve it? Probably all of us, if we're honest. Week two, Pastor Keith moved into more practical notion where he based his message on this. Therefore, I urge you, and the therefore always connects to what's before. And before in Romans, we hear how God again has rescued his people by his grace. We couldn't do it. The things Paul writes, the good that I want to do, I don't do. The evil that I don't want to do, that's what I do. How wretched am I? Who will rescue me from this body of death? And he says, thanks be to God who rescues us, who saves us through Jesus. And then he says, therefore, because of all that, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. So it's like, I've been given grace. How do I live that out? And he gave some very practical examples last week. In fact, it haunted me this week. So he talks about grace in action. He talked about his own struggles, sometimes driving to downtown to the new office. Well, Monday morning, I go to the bank. They got two tellers on and 17 people in line, and it's not moving. And I'm on a clock, and I am boiling. And I'm ready to say, like, you guys make a lot of money in this place. Could we not have more than two tellers on? As I get closer, I'm kind of hearing the conversations from up front. These two people that are up there, they're doing their best. And all I could remember was Keith's message on Sunday morning. You don't know what's going on all the time. Put the best construction on it. Maybe they need grace as much as you need grace. And I said, they said, first thing that he says, sorry, it took so long. It's okay, you're having a busy morning, I'm sure. He said, yes, really hard morning. I said, it's okay. Did I want to respond that way? No. Grace in us, when we see grace in us, it helps us respond. But in our humanness, it is still hard. You see, I also failed this week, by the way, many times in living that out. But when we're challenged, when it's top of mind, sometimes God can catch us and our reaction becomes different. See, grace, we all need it. It's as a gift. We can't earn it or deserve it. It's one for us and all people right there at the cross. That's why it's center in our sanctuary reminder. And as I look back at my 29 years at First Lutheran, 56 years on this side of eternity, I see this truth at work. This is my reflection on this, in this passage and this truth. The most gracious people that I've encountered, the most gracious people, people are the ones who first experience grace in a very personal way. I'll say it again. The most gracious people on this planet, on this side of eternity, are ones who have experienced grace personally. They know their failures. They know their need for grace and for forgiveness. They are also somewhat the most grateful and content people I know on the planet. People who have not experienced grace or superficially or theoretically experienced grace are some of the least gracious, most judgmental, and unhappy people on the planet. Let me say that one again. 
People who have not experienced grace or only superficially or theoretically experienced grace, like, yeah, God died for my sins. No, no, he died for each one of your sins and mine. Even this morning, your thoughts, your words, your actions, and mine. Those who have not experienced it personally are some of the least gracious, most judgmental, and unhappy people on the planet. How does that tie into today? Because if we're going to live grace-filled lives so that other people would know our grace-filled God, then we need to experience God's grace and his forgiveness. It's what we receive in the baptismal font. We put it right at the entrance to the sanctuary intentionally, entrance to the kingdom, this gift of grace, faith as a gift. When we come around Lord's Supper, the gift of forgiveness reminded his body and his blood. A story that I think reflects this in what Jesus was trying to say to us most accurately comes from uh, Luke chapter 7. And because we don't... <laughs> We've, we've taken so many things out of here during the summer renovations that I'm just going to read it, not from the Bible this morning, but from the Bible. It's on my phone right here. This is from Luke chapter 7. If you're reading along on your Bible gateway or wherever you are this morning, um, Luke chapter 7, starting at about verse 31. And he's telling this story about grace. When one of the Pharisees, this is verse 36, when one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life, remember sin defined, Pastor Keith said, as missing the mark. We can all identify with the fact that we miss the mark in our thoughts and our words and our actions. Lived a sinful life, learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house and so she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume and as she stood behind him, uh, at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is. She is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii, the other 50 Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? And Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt to be forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. If you and I don't see how much we need God's forgiveness in a personal way, it's hard for us to be gracious with anybody else. So if you stand in the mirror and you look honestly what your heart and your mind and who you are, and you sort of judge that in line with God's commands for us, it would be hard to stand there and not say, I, I need help. It's what God provides. It's his grace. For by grace are you and I saved through faith, not of ourselves, so that we have no reason to boast. No reason to boast, because it's all his gift from the cross. People who experience true grace are far more likely to be gracious and to overflow with that grace so that others will see him. That's the picture. The church is to be a grace place, a hospital for those who are broken and who blow it, those who need assistance. It's not a country club for the saints. I'm going to talk more about that next week in part two. Uh, we're here to be his grace-filled, overflowing grace people in action. See, the law destroys, but God's grace heals. It heals us, period. Period. When we realize that without God's grace, we're doomed, when we realize that on our own, we're not getting out alive, when we realize the true truth of Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, for by grace are we saved through faith, then we can grasp what verse 10 means. Verse 10, because you've been saved by grace, you're God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good 
works, which God's prepared in advance and equipped us to do. We don't live grace to earn more grace. We don't share love to be more loved. We don't offer forgiveness and eternal life so that we can gain it. We do it because those things are ours already, the free gift. And we don't share grace because we have to, but because we get to. In thankfulness to God for all the grace he gives to us, we overflow with grace to each other. It isn't easy. We don't do it because we have to. We do it because we get to. Empowered by God and his spirit. I'm reading a book uh, this summer. I'm loving it. It's called Liturgy of the Ordinary by Tish Harrison Warren. She takes the very mundane things of our life, because most of us spend a lot of time in mundane things, in brushing our teeth, in making our beds, in doing chores, in interacting with people in just practical ways that aren't really exciting. And she turns this into a spiritual lesson every day of how God meets us where we're at. And she has this picture of looking in the mirror. When you look in the mirror in the morning, do you see your wrinkles and your failures inside and out? Do you see the mess? You need to get the smudge off your face or you, some of you have more work to do than me to get that ready. As your first reaction, I am God's handiwork. Is it like, oh, look at this aging body. Or if some people knew what was really in here, how would they see me? And she says, when you look in the mirror, ready to brush your teeth in the morning, or when you wake up on your pillow, your first thought should be, God made me and he saved me. And I'm his because of his grace. And he's going to go with me today. You imagine every morning, if you looked in the mirror and you thought, I am God's handiwork created to do good works. What's he going to go and do through me today? Not because I have to, but because I get to. Is that different than, oh, no, not another day. Here's your challenge this week. Find your favorite passages that remind you of how loved you are. Maybe it's by grace you've been saved through faith, faith, Ephesians 2. Right through to verse 10, you're God's handiwork. Put stickies on your mirror in the bathroom. When you get up in the morning, you're reminded, God made me. God saved me, God has a plan for me, and he's going to walk with me because I'm his handiwork. And he's got grace to live to others through me. I guarantee it will change how you interact with people this week. Because you're so good, but because God is. Because when he speaks words to us, it changes who we are. Um, in about 18 years ago, we did a dad-daughter event here in this sanctuary. There was 100 dads in the room. And... During that event, uh, we learned about the culture that our girls are growing up in and the tensions that they live of body image and all the stresses and struggles on them. And then there was three teenagers on the, on the platform that night up here that talked to the dads in the room. And there was three messages. One, don't yell so much, dads. We hear you. Just bring, bring it down a notch. Two, find ways to build memories with us. Even when we're pushing you away, Build memories with us. Keep us close. And thirdly, I'll never forget this. Tell us as often as possible that we are beautiful, capable, and loved. I believe that's what God wants you and I to hear every day. I have made you. You are beautiful, you are capable, and you are loved. That will change how we interact with the world because that grace given to us is what the world needs.